is entirely full. That's, uh, that's crazy. Um, here we are. Um, I've, I've entitled the talk, The Future of Identity. It's kind of uh, hopeful, but we'll see if we can get there. Um, I want to start with some open questions. Uh, what, what is it that makes the money go round? Uh, Dr. David Chaum talked about what it was to make money happen, but how does the money move around and why, do, why is this important? Um, and also, what makes communities? Are they good, bad, or resilient? Or um, how do we make people work together? And, and finally, what is this thing called identity that we keep coming back to? And I really want to ask um, an open question. Do we, in fact, need it? And how are we going to find it, of course? And, and that's our identity there. We're a small group. We're growing rapidly. But rather than focus on who we are, there's that question down the bottom. Why does that matter? Um, and we know it's circulating around this question of trust. Uh, identity and trust seem to work together. Uh, why do we need the trust to make identity work? Why do we need identity to make trust work? And why is it happening now? Well, that, that's easy to answer. Blockchain has unleashed this huge momentum of activity. Millions of people, billions of value. Uh, although I haven't checked the price today, it's uh, not been so good over the last couple of weeks, but it's still big. Uh, but interestingly enough, on the blockchain, nobody knows anybody to any great degree. And hence, there's this notion that it is trustless, which is fantastic and uh, exciting. Uh, but actually, the blockchain doesn't have a particularly good reputation for having succeeded in, in the notion of trade. We've got theft and DDoS and perpetual scams going on. And I would like to propose to you um, an outrageous statement, if you like. Complexity. Complexity in trade plus, plus trust will outcompete trustlessness. So... The, way, the reason I think this is important is because if you look at the big money, the big trade, the big companies, they're actually sitting on the sidelines. The big money is yet to come in. And the reason for this is, I believe, because there is no trust in the blockchain, they don't enter. They're sitting on the sidelines. And commonly speaking, people will come back and they will say, we're waiting for identity. We need identity to solve this problem, reduce the crime and enable trade. So it's important what this thing identity is. And it turns out, in, at least in my view, there are four main schools of thought. One is the state provides you with identity. Everybody in this room has some piece of paper that is supplied by the state. And, and this is in essence saying, well, the state will tell us who we are. Uh, the corporation will also collect lots of records. And therefore, the corporation has this view over who we are. I'm a set of corporation records in some view. And there's a completely different notion that I am who I think I am. I am the person in my head. And this is kind of a bit weird, because when we start talking about identity systems, from a technical point of view, you cannot see into my head and I can't see into your head. And, and probably we want it that way. It would just be too scary otherwise. And finally, there is the sense of community. And this is this notion that I am who you say I am. You look at me and you give me identity by your, uh, your honor of listening to me and looking at me. And you can go down this set of um, criteria, th this, these categories, and you can think about the notion of building a technical system of identity. The first three fail because for various reasons, they're constructed in ways which aren't useful to us as technologists. But the last one turns out to be worth looking at, worth experimenting with. So what is community and, and so forth? Well, it turns out that your identity is really the sum of your interactions amongst your peers in this context, if we're talking about community identity. Now, those interactions are really important. We can capture each of those interactions in some fashion and turn them into a digital record which enables identity to be discovered and, uh, and listened to and worked with. So that's what I'm going to describe as we move on. Um, 
Clearly, identity is a social construct. If we're talking from the position of community, we're talking about meeting people and making something of that. And, and this was the origin of a thing called the web of trust. Back in the early 90s, PGB created this notion where you would have your public key out there and you would meet somebody and they would sign your public key. And that's the beginning of the notion that an interaction between you and another person can be captured digitally and used. Now, unfortunately, this mechanism failed. And the reason it failed was because PGP itself only really gave you the notion of capturing that you had met somebody. And it wasn't sufficiently meaningful. What did it mean? Did it mean this person was a good person or a bad person? Did this mean that your name was as was described? Nobody really knew. There was no standard. So social interactions can inform a bit more than that. We can say that somebody can tell you your name by putting it into a digital record. And if we do that enough times, if, if one person says that your name is Alice, if another person says that, and then everybody else in your community agrees that your name happens to be Alice, then this redundancy makes it so. If the community says you are Alice, then you are Alice. You may have other names, but for that community, you are that name. And this is the power of the community expressing itself over you and your identity. So your name then is the sum of these beliefs of the various people inside your community. Um, and this is, this is this notion that you find yourself only through your community. It's, it's very powerful, but very scary and perhaps outrageous to say this. Your identity is not necessarily what's in yourself. But is that really enough? It turns out that there are too many names, too many communities. You have first names, last names, family names. Uh, when your titles change, this can be an issue with the name. There's also problems with multiple people having the same name, so we need to de-conflict. There's community, nicknames, marriage, and so forth. All of these problems cause issues if you're trying to capture somebody's name. So what we need, if you like, is something we then moved on to from PGP's Web of Trust in CA Cert, and we said, basically, when somebody says that your name is such and such, my name is Ian, your name might be Alice, this should be done according to a policy, a statement. So a surer says the, the surey is someone according to a particular policy. That's standardizing the, price, uh, the process. But we need much more. Um, there are so many other things about you that are important. Uh, we need relationships, documents. Do you have a degree? Did you go to a school? The various history of your work experience your life interests and so forth, can all be captured. So generalizing that, if I say of you about something, I should do this according to a something standard. Someone says some, someone else is something according to a something standard. And that generalized concept is what we now call an attribute. So we're getting to the point where we can describe people in a more general fashion. And if we can collect all of these attributes together, where many people have said many things about you, we can take, if you like, an empty vessel, a circle, that pink circle there, and we can paint on the attributes and come up with a very close idea of who you are in a sense of community. And the important thing here is we can do this in a technological fashion. We can write the code to do this. Um, but there's problems with this notion. Why would anybody say the right thing? Why don't they say the wrong thing? If you look at the internet, it's pretty wild. People are saying the wrong things all the time. Why would we start acting better just because we can do this technological uh, data trick? And it turns out that really, people will only care about this process if there are consequences, so that good acts cause good good effects, but bad acts can cause bad effects. And this is, if you like, the shortfall of the internet, the shortfall of blockchain, is that there are no consequences for bad acts. 
So we need a feedback loop that allows those bad acts to feed back. In some sense, we need positive rewards, we need negative corrections. And we call that uh, correction the resolution of disputes. If somebody has done something wrong to you, said something wrong about you, perhaps in an attribute, you need a way to correct that. We call that a dispute, we need to resolve that dispute, something that we're going to find in community. But we also need skin in the game. Um, we need some sense that having resolved the dispute, you can be, if you like, uh, punished in some fashion. It's all getting very scary, but we need this sense of being able to correct. So the sum of it is right here and now, if you like. We don't actually know enough about identity, but what we do have is a lot of experience. Web of Trust failed because it lacked that meaning. PKI also failed, and the reason was PKI had no consequences, negative or positive. Social networks failed because you don't care what you put into social networks. It's garbage in, garbage out, so the result is undefined over the long run. It can't be relied upon. Now, blockchain fails for a very particular reason, and that's because of privacy. We do not want to put all this data onto the open blockchain, which leaves us with a very tricky problem. So identity, if you like, at this point is a fail. But we can fix each of those things. We can define what these identity attributes are about. We can put liability in with community approaches. We can acquire the skin in the game. Um, we can use redundancy of many opinions to overcome the problem of garbage in, garbage out in social networks. And we can take the published data that is on the blockchain and move it into the local domain, if we can figure out how to do that. So there are fixes for most of these things. But what we're lacking is a sense of how we build the community to bring all this together. And this is where I need to make a leap. I'm not smart enough to be able to build that or invent that community, but it seems like it actually exists and I've observed it, and that's what I want to move on to now, and that is, whoops, here we go, Kenya. We went to Kenya about 2012, searching for the next generation of financial cryptography. Uh, the field which was started with Blinder Cash by uh, Professor Chom in his first presentation. And this is based on a thing called M-Peso, which is mobile phone money. Basically, your mobile phone has money on it, you can transmit it to anybody else. And the impact of this was extraordinary. It changed the supply chain for the country. No longer did merchants need to send envelopes of paper money on buses by a complicated relationship mechanism, they could simply use their payment, their mobile phones to send the money to their suppliers and the goods would turn up on the buses a bit later. It solved one half of the supply chain problem for Kenya, which added percentage points to their growth and their wealth. It was amazing stuff. And so we, we thought this must be the foundation for the next generation of uh, financial cryptography. We went in there, but we struck a problem immediately. Uh, the, the Kenyans have a term for this. It's called the wazungu, and literally it means aimless wanderers. It is applied to the white male people, primarily, who come to Africa and say, we're going to do some good. We wander around aimlessly, we spend some money, and then we leave. The problem is we go there, we see nothing, we know nothing, and we improve nothing because we can't actually observe what's going on. But by luck, serendipity, I actually discovered that there was a very interesting artifact, a very interesting institution in Kenya, and this is called the Chama. Chama is simply a word for group in Swahili, the local language, and these are tiny groups of women coming together to do social savings, which is to say they save in a little group of five to 30 people because they have the long view and they need to move forward. Now, this is called, I'll try this in Korean, hui or kie in Korean. You can see those words there. Um, I hope the translator was, is not too offended. Um, 
these community groups exist all the way across the world, primarily in the developing world, because that's where we do not have good banking payment systems. They're completely voluntary, they're rules-based, they're very organized, and they have a deep and long culture. They exist for one reason and one reason alone, as far as I can see. Or they exist for one cause, and that is corruption. If you have a society where money is robbed on a daily basis, you still need to save. You can't save at the bank because the bank is corrupt. Insiders will conspire with outside criminals to steal your money, and this happens all the time. You can't save at home, you can't put money into the mattress because your family members might save, uh, might steal it. So what the women do is they come together in small groups where they all have the same problem, saving enough money to get the kids to school or to get an investment. And they force each other to save together as a community. Um, they're small. They are also extremely trusted. You only form a chama with people you trust and have known over a long period of time. It might be a marketplace group. It might be the last year of university or school where you've known all of the uh, children or the young adults for the last four or five years and you know who is a good actor or who is a bad actor. Um, they're very, very strong against this outside theft problem. They've worked that out. They're also relatively strong against inside theft, but they do have a little bit of a problem there. Um, and it's, it's worth noting that the reason it works is because they import the trust from outside, and then once it's inside, it builds and builds. But it also creates a very interesting place for the person's identity. The people in Kenya love their chamas. Their chamas are their moment where they can be with their peers. And in a sense, their identity grows because they're in a chama. To lose their chamas would be devastation to them, personally. So I kind of like to you know, make that note that this small group is the key to nurturing identity. So if you can bring the small group of known and trusted people together and have skin in the game, that is their savings, in the place of one, uh, one room, one meeting, then this creates community, solid community, the beating heart of community. But it's not all wonderful. Um, with any small group, there are, hot, there are problems. It's a hotbed of intrigue. There are arguments and losses and problems. So we are looking at this process, thinking, how can we help this? Uh, we, we white Wazungu, having come this far to understanding what's going on, and we've got this sense that, OK, we can fix this. We can help this, but without changing their social behavior. They have paper accounting. They do their laborious savings on paper in the old double entry way with big books which they copy lines across to make this work. It's very slow and cumbersome and there are of course many potential errors that can creep in there. We know how to do accounting on the internet now so we can change that. We can also take their savings and their investments and turn them dramatically into much better things. We can turn the, soft, uh, the, the notion of an investment into a bus or a piece of land into percentage points and so forth. And we can create, if you like, an issuance of crypto for every one of their assets. Now that we have this notion of uh, cryptography as a foundation for, information, uh, for issuance of assets. Um, they have another problem and that is surprising. Uh, they actually are very good at saving. They can save a lot of money, and when they've got to the point of saving a lot of money, they want to invest this money. It's actually that point where they have the most trouble because the investment environment is very poor. Remember, corruption is ever-present, so the ability to find a good investment is, is definitely a problem. But we can bring them together, and they can work together on that fashion, and also offer each other um, investments of quality. 
So our big idea, if you like, is to take this notion of the small social savings group, Kenya's Chamas or uh, Korea's Hui, and use the governed community approach that we've developed over a long period of time in CA CERT, and also we're putting into place in EOS, the blockchain, add some blockchain to this concept and make an app out of it, because the, uh, the Kenyan people really understand their apps, they really understand the notion of mobile phone money, so savings to them on the phone is really actually an easy ask. And all of this, bringing all this technology into place is, um, of course, a very deep subject, but I'll just quickly move on and talk about blockchain. This is a blockchain conference, so I need to insert some blockchain in there. What do we need blockchain for? We need to be able to create a single cash unit that works across all of the, um, the, the chamas across the country, and this therefore needs a network that mounts that cash unit, for which blockchain and a fiat currency or a stablecoin would be ideal. We also need to conquer the privacy and security problems of blockchain, and we're doing this, if you like, in a slightly different way. Uh, the problem is we cannot put any privacy-related data onto a public blockchain because of the corruption. Even just knowing that there's an amount of money being collected is a target, a magnet for crooks and thieves in a corrupt environment. But what we can do is flip the problem upside down. We can give every chama its own small blockchain which accounts for its activity by sharing the ledger amongst all of their phones. And this enables them to keep their data inside locally and still get the benefits of a blockchain as being a uh, good, strong way to do accounting shared amongst themselves. And we can use the uh, notion of blockchain to issue these holdings as investments. Um, okay. So I asked at the beginning this whole thing about identity and community. And um, the notion here is that we have found, if you like, an ideal base for the notion of individual identity inside a very small community. Um, but we need to make sure that these very small communities do not share their data outside or, not, or are not led to share their data outside unwittingly. Because if that were to happen, then the locals would detect this difficulty and reject the system. They must be protected in terms of their privacy. And it also is, from this base, very easy for us to do this notion of attributes, collect the interactions inside, and therefore we can now start to move towards, if you like, a future which is much, uh, much more potent. So I asked these initial questions, what does make the money go round? And I, and I would like to say that it is the ability to have a relationship and trust with the people you are trading. This notion of supply chain in Kenya got a huge uh, boot forward with M-Pesa because we could now move money through a trusted provider, that's Safaricom, to a person a long way away and therefore you could reliably trust that situation. That made the money go round. What makes communities? It turns out that it's smallness that makes a community. Two things, smallness and adversity, because the adversity creates the climate where you must be strong. And finally, that skin in the game allows us to develop that uh, sense of correction of bad behavior, so we can control the worst uh, things that go on. And finally, what is identity? Um, I say it's what you find inside good community, at least in a technical sense. So uh, that's, that's what we're doing as Chama Pesa. It's an app to do cryptocurrencies as accounting for small social savings groups. Um, we discovered the, the last piece of the puzzle in Kenya. That's the small community as opposed to a large community. We have the big challenge of exporting that small community out globally, which we're thinking about. And uh, the interesting thing is we get identity for free. And that's it.